Good morning, Glenkirk Church friends and family, wherever you may be worshiping with us today. We're glad that you're with us, glad that you're tuning in, and glad that we are together in this. On this um, last Sunday, before we begin the season of Lent, this last Sunday of our Shattered Mirrors series that we've been in um, for the last seven weeks. You know, every child hears the nursery rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. And the intention, of course, of that rhyme is to help young kids brush off the hurtful and mean words that other kids may say to them. But the truth is that words really can hurt us, can't they? Sometimes words are more hurtful than physical blows. Words matter. We've been this last seven weeks in this series called Shattered Mirrors, and over the last seven weeks we've been talking about the the biblical doctrine, the biblical teaching, that all people everywhere are created in the image of God, made to mirror their maker in unique ways. And because of this clear biblical doctrine, all people everywhere have value, young and old abled and disabled, immigrant citizen, born and unborn, rich and poor, all people everywhere have value as image bearers of God. And even though sin has corrupted the image of God within us, that image still remains, although it is shattered. And that remaining image still confers inherent value on every person. And over the last couple of weeks, we've looked at the implications of this biblical teaching to various topics in our world today, like racism and our relationship to our government and how we treat differences between people. And then last Sunday, on the sacred value of every human life. And today we finish this series by talking about our words And from James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, we're going to see five warnings about how we, as God's image bearers made to mirror our maker, five warnings about how we use our words. So let's look at the text together. James chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers. Because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. 
The reason why I included this topic and this text from James in this series is because of verse 9. That James bases his warnings in this text on the biblical truth that we've been talking about in this series. That all people everywhere have been made in God's image and likeness. Verse 8 of James 3 reinforces the truth that the image of God remains in people even after sin came into the world. Now this section is a warning about the power of the tongue. And when James wrote this letter, most people he was writing to didn't know how to read or write. James's letter would have been read out loud when the early church gathered in someone's home, since back then no more than 5 to 10 percent of the population would have known how to read or write themselves. The ancient world was what scholars call an oral culture, where most communication was spoken. And this is why James talks about the tongue in his warning about words. But for us today, we live in a written culture where the majority of people do know how to read and write. And what James says here about what we say with our tongue applies just as much to what we write with our hands. The warnings of James chapter 3 apply apply not only to what we say to each other, but also to what we text, what we post on social media, what we write in a letter or an email. And James begins in verse 1 with a warning to teachers about misleading words. Not many people should become teachers in the church because of the temptation and the danger of communicating words that would be misleading. Now in the ancient church, being a teacher in the church, being what we would call a pastor or a teaching elder, was considered a huge honor. And so it's not surprising that some people back then and some people today would be drawn to this, these leadership roles before they were fully qualified or adequately prepared for the unique challenges and temptations that come from these leadership roles. A person who becomes a teacher in the church can profoundly influence the lives of other people. A power differential exists between church leaders who teach and the people who place themselves under that leader's teaching. And this opens up the possibility that misleading words could be spoken or written that could cause significant harm in the lives of people. And because of this potential, those who teach, says James, will be judged more strictly. And so here's the warning of verse 1. Though words may give us influence in people's lives, misleading words will lead to condemnation. Misleading words will lead to condemnation. Teachers in the church can engage in misleading words in a variety of different ways. Misleading words can take the form of words that contradict the clear teaching of the Bible. And I'm not talking about areas where, where Christians have legitimate differences of opinion about how to interpret certain parts of the Bible or how to apply them today. I'm, I'm talking about misleading words that contradict clear biblical affirmations like the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, the literal resurrection of Jesus, the sufficiency of Christ's death, these kinds of things. And as a teaching elder in the church, I live under the constant weight that the words that I teach must line up with the clear teaching of the Bible and with sound biblical theology. And if I ever deviate from that, I will answer to God for it. This is a weighty burden at times. And any teacher who doesn't feel the weight of that burden is not ready for the ministry of teaching. But you know, misleading words can also be manipulative words. 
When teachers in the church leverage their authority as a, as a leader to get people to do things that they want them to do, that's another example of misleading words. This is how spiritual abuse happens in the church. And it can happen in subtle ways. I, I once knew of a pastor who decided to remodel his home and he leveraged his role as a pastor to manipulate some of the contractors in his church to do the work for free. Or it can happen in bigger ways. Like international ministry leaders that we've heard about recently who use their spiritual authority in order to exploit other people. The words of Christian leaders who teach can influence people in wonderful ways, but those who misuse those words will answer to God for it. This leads James in verse 2 to expand from teachers to everyone else as he talks about disobedient words, beginning in verse 2. And James says that all of us stumble, all of us sin in different ways. One guy that I once worked with in his journey to become a pastor used to say that, that there are as many different ways to sin as there are flavors of ice cream. And your favorite flavor may not be my favorite flavor, but we all have an ice cream problem, he used to say. But one area of sin that we all share in common is our words. James says that if a person could completely control their words, that they would be as close to being perfect as they could get. And he uses a couple of metaphors to illustrate how disobedient words can lead us to stumble into sin. The first is a bit that a rider uses to control a horse. With a tiny bit in the horse's mouth, a rider can control the entire direction of the horse. Even though horses are larger and more powerful than riders, by using a bit, a rider can control a horse that weighs 1,500 pounds more than the rider weighs. The other metaphor he uses is that of a rudder on a ship. A tiny rudder can steer a ship through a storm. These metaphors illustrate how something seemingly small and seemingly insignificant can control the entire direction of something very large. You see, though our words may seem insignificant, disobedient words can cause us to stumble into sin. Disobedient words and cause us to stumble. When we speak out loud words that we know are contrary to what God wants for our lives, it's like a bit in a horse's mouth that turns our entire life towards what those words are expressing. Or when we post or text words that we know are contrary to God's ways, it's like a rudder that begins to change the direction of our lives towards what those words express. As image bearers of God, made in the image and likeness of God, the words that we speak and that we write have unique power. Just as the God who created us used words, God used words to create the world. He, he makes covenants with words. He, he makes promises to us with words. Our words as image bearers of God can change the direction of our lives. And disobedient words, words that we know are contrary to what God wants for us, may seem insignificant at the time, but they can lead our lives straight into stumbling into sin. The third warning in verses 5 and 6 is about boastful words. Boastful words. The, the word translated boast in verse 5, it means to express an, an inappropriate and unhealthy level of confidence in ourselves. Boastful words are prideful words, pretentious, arrogant words. And James uses another word picture here that of a spark that sets a forest on fire. That's what boastful words can do. 
Back in 2003, uh, a spark from an off-road motorcycle set a fire in the San Bernardino National Forest that was dubbed the Grand Prix Fire. And the Grand Prix Fire, as it grew, it joined with another fire in the San Bernardino Mountains during that fire season. And together, those fires ended up destroying 60,000 acres. In 2003, at the time of the Grand Prix fire, I was the lead pastor at a church in the foothills of the San Bernardino Mountains, and I was also a police chaplain for our local police department. And on the night of the Grand Prix fire's greatest damage to the community, I rode in uniform with a police officer who attended our church. And as we rode through North Upland and San Antonio Heights announcing mandatory evacuations and helping people get out of the area, the fire line grew closer and closer to residential areas. One point during the night, we were helping people evacuate near San Antonio Dam and San Antonio Heights when the winds shifted and the fire line began advancing directly towards where we were. And I've never seen anything like it. As this blaze created its own weather and destroyed everything it came in contact with. And as we got the last family evacuated, we hopped into the police cruiser and drove back to safety safety quickly. And we were both covered in ash and soot. By the end of that night, the Grand Prix fire had destroyed 136 homes injured a a member of the congregation I pastored who eventually died from his injuries and had come within a hundred yards of the church that I pastored. So much devastation caused by one spark. That's what boastful words can do. See, although some words may appear unimportant, boastful words can be destructive. It can set a fire. And this is why Proverbs 6 says that one of the things God hates is pride. That's why later in the book of James, in chapter 4, James will say that God opposes the proud. Because boastful words can set entire lives and entire communities on fire. And although it's tempting for us to point to the world to see examples of boastful words uttered by people who don't follow Jesus, the truth is is that we all fall prey to boastful words when we say or write things that are self-promoting to try to make us appear better than we really are, when we make grand claims about things that we haven't actually looked into to see whether they're true or not. These words may appear unimportant, but they can spark a fire of destruction. Verses 7 and 8 warn us about hasty words. Hasty words. Here, James makes an observation that we've tamed all different kinds of animals, but we can't tame ourselves and how we use words. This is a look back at Genesis chapter 1, God's creation of humans in the image of God and then of all the animals and God blessing humanity to subdue the earth which includes the ability to tame animals. As, As image bearers of God, we're able to ride horses and elephants. We can teach pigeons to carry messages for us and parrots to talk. We can train sea otters and dolphins to do tricks and entertain us. I've been trying to train a new puppy not to chew on my flip-flops or the TV remote, which is a work in progress. We can tame animals, but we can't tame how we use our words. Many Bible scholars believe that verse 8, when it says that our words are restless, evil, full of deadly poison, is actually describing a venomous snake. In the ancient world, when people walked to get where they were going and roads weren't paved, venomous snakes striking suddenly were a constant danger. See, even though words may sometimes be spoken unintentionally, hasty words can be poison. As poisonous as a rattlesnake bite. 
Hasty words can poison relationships. When we blurt out words to people without thinking about what we're saying and the effect of those words, untamed and impulsively, those words cannot be erased or taken back. They can be forgiven, but they cannot be erased. When we write or post words hastily in the heat of the moment, those words can be a snake bite in the lives of people. Words like, I wish I'd never met you, or I hate you, or you're just another mindless sheep. Those words are like venomous fangs, injecting poison into your relationship with that person. I'm going to share a story with you that I'm ashamed to share of. When I was pastoring my very first church when I was 29 years old, I used to stop at this family-owned coffee shop on my drive to the church office in the morning. And a high school student whose family attended the church that I was pastoring at that time, their high school student's son got caught shoplifting by the owners of this coffee shop. And the owners knew this student and his family attended the church that I was pastoring, and so they told me about it. And some hasty words slipped out of my mouth that I wish I'd never said. I said, yeah, that whole family has a lot of issues. Little did I know that the student's cousin was sitting at a table in the coffee shop overhearing the entire conversation. And my hasty words poisoned my relationship with that family. Hasty words spoken by an immature 29-year-old pastor brought, brought damage to that family. And although they eventually forgave me, it was a difficult, painful journey of hasty words spoken in the moment. They may, hasty words may seem unintentional, but they can have the effect of a snake bite. The last warning has to do with degrading words in verses 9 through 12. Our words can bring God praise. We use words to sing songs of praise as we've done in this service, to lift up our prayers of praise to God, to give testimony to what God has done in our lives. We compose worship songs and write poems and we post praise reports on social media. Our words have the capacity to magnify God's character for others to see, to shine a light on God's greatness, and to lift up God's majesty. But our words can also curse people who are created in God's image. And the cursing James is talking about is not talking about cussing, although I, it could include that. The Greek word means to wish injury or harm on someone with our words. Cursing here is speaking or writing in a way that wishes harm on another person. When we curse a human being who bears God's image, we are cursing the God who created that person in his image. Praising God in one breath and cursing God's image bearer in the next breath, James says, is a contradiction. It's, it, it makes no more sense than a water source producing fresh, drinkable water and salty, undrinkable water from the same source. It makes no more sense than a tree producing two different kinds of fruit. But if we want to praise God with our words, we need to bless God's image bearers with our words. Although our words can give praise to God, degrading words about people dishonor God. Words that wish harm on people dishonor God. Whether those words are whispered or shouted, texted or posted on Facebook, tweeted or communicated through sign language, degrading words about people dishonor God. If we really want to learn to praise God with our words, we need to learn to speak life-giving words of blessing to God's image bearers. And it's easy to bless those who bless us. 
It's easy to to speak words of blessing on those who wish us well. As Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, it's easy to love those who love you, to love your friends and to love your family. The hard part is loving those who don't love us, blessing those who curse us, speaking life-giving words to those who wish the worst for us. But this is the way of Jesus. Now, if you're like me, this is a convicting message to hear. Because although we may all stumble in different ways, each with our favorite flavor of sin, we all have in common trouble controlling our words. I can train my puppy, and I can't train my own words. We've seen five warnings from James chapter 3. Misleading words that lead to condemnation. Disobedient words that lead us to stumble into sin. Boastful words that can destroy like a wildfire. Hasty words that can poison like a snake bite. And degrading words that dishonor the God we praise. You know, the last couple of weeks of this sermon series have revealed some parts of our lives and I believe some parts of the church across our land that desperately need God to change. As image bearers of God whose whose image has been shattered by our sin, we become aware that God needs to do His work of renewing and restoring us into the image of the Maker who created us. And as we look to Jesus, the image of the invisible God, we can see what human life is supposed to look like. And as I look to Jesus in the Bible, I'm simultaneously inspired by what I see and convicted and humbled by how far I fall short. But this is a moment for hope, not for despair. Because the transformation that we need will not come through our own self-efforts or self-improvement or self-discipline. The reason we can't tame ourselves the way we can tame puppies and sea otters is because we need more than behavior modification. We need internal spiritual transformation. And as we end this series on the image of God, we end with a hopeful invitation for each of us to look once again to the God who loves us, the God who made us, and the God who can change us. Because He alone is the one who can renew us into the image of Jesus over time. Next week begins the season of Lent. And I hope you'll be participating on Ash Wednesday with one of the three ways we've mentioned. And as we enter into the season of Lent, a season of repentance and confession, our new sermon series is called New Rhythms, where we'll look at five classic spiritual rhythms that can open us further to God for Him to do His transforming work. I hope you'll fully lean into Lent this year. On Ash Wednesday, receiving the ashes of repentance, humility, and mortality. And experimenting with some maybe new spiritual rhythms to open you to the transforming work of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for making us in your image. And it carries great weight that includes our words that can give life, that can poison and start fires. God, we need your work of grace to transform us. As we enter into the season of Lent on Wednesday, we enter confessing how we fall short, admitting to you that we cannot change ourselves and asking you to do your work, to continue your work of making us like Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen.